to, you know, last week we talked about God's holiness and his, the fact that he is the almighty and the creator of the universe and, and he deserves our utmost reverence and awe and respect all the time. But with that attitude of heart that we have towards him in that way, that condition is met and it brings us into correct and right relationship with him. And Jesus made the way for us to share in companionship and participation with Jesus Christ. You know, look at, I wasn't going to do this, but look at Philippians, I think. I think it's Philippians 2. And then we'll get into the meat of it. Uh, huh. Verse 4, Philippians 2, 4, let, let each of you esteem and look upon and be conserved for not me, merely his own interest, but each also each for the interest of others. But let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus, who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, did not think his equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but he stripped himself of all rightful privileges and dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being. And after being, he appeared in human form, he abased and humbles himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. You know, here Jesus, he sheds these robes in these royal crowns and becomes a human being and saves mankind. <laughs> mankind that he created, all of creation was created through him and Jesus did this for us. And He's called us into companionship and participation with him. And, you know, uh, like what I did minister last week about God's holiness and everything, you know, so many people look at that as such a, like it's a downer or that, oh, you know, that's, you're chastising us. No. Why would you want a God any less than that? I mean, he is the almighty creator God. And that's the way he is. And we should accept that. And we should see that truth and, and order our lives right for that. But Jesus came and we are sharing in, in participation with him of the restoration of everything. And not only spirit, soul, and body, but the, the planet, the entire planet. This is a high and heady thing that God has called us to be in participation with him with. And he wants us to participate with him. He doesn't want to do it himself. If he did, he would have just done it himself. But he didn't. He called a body together to do it with him. Because God wants to share with us all the beautiful things that he's going to do, right? Look at Revelation. You have a... I just want to say one thing. Yeah. The Father God is no different than a loving Father. Right. He's his own son. Right. He's his protection. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. He disciplines us for our certain good. Yes. Right? But in Revelation 2, and this is interesting because Ray preached on this Wednesday night about the deep things of that we're moving into, you know, uh, we talk a whole lot about end times around here. Of course, Friday nights, is that is the subject. And um, these are deep things. And, but if you're just looking at geopolitical things, those aren't really deep things. I mean, a natural men can see that. Um, and Jesus has called us to follow him. And... Uh, 
he knows what real deep things are, but, you know, there, and then on the other side, on the other hand, there's the deep things of Satan. And he was chastising the church in Thyatira for this and, you know, telling them, hey, they need to repent, you know, or he was going to throw them on a bed of anguish, right? So much for hyper grace, right? You know, but really, that is grace. You know, he would rather throw you on a bed of anguish if you're that stubborn and, and that uh, disobedient to get you to turn than to just go ahead and destroy yourself. And that is mercy. But, uh, verse um, 24, But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold these teachings, who have not explored and known the depths of Satan, as they say, I tell you that I do not lay upon you any other fresh burden. Right? Only hold fast to what you have until I come. All right, so what do we have that we need to hold fast to? Well, a lot. A lot of things we need to hold fast to. You know, you, you, could, you could go down your list of, you know, things God's blessed you with, you know, your house or your family and, you know, your vehicles and all the food you eat and blah, blah, blah. You know, all those things, which are fine, and God blesses us with all those things. But the real treasures are in here. They're in the Word. The real treasures are the covenant that God made with us and all the things that that involves. And let me tell you, I got in the Word to, because he's saying, hold fast to what you have until I come. And it would take us till tomorrow night to go through it all, and we'd probably still be just getting started, right? There's so much that God has blessed us with in the way of what he has revealed to us over all these years. We're so, so blessed. And not only that he's just revealed it to us, but it's ours. He's given it to us. It's it's real. It, we, we partake of it. Uh, so, you know, he's saying, hold fast what you have until I come. <laughs> you know, in the very next verse, you know, he said, he who overcomes uh, to the, and keep, obeys my commands to the very end, I will give him authority and power over the nations. I mean, like I say, this is a high it's heady. I mean, we just look at our, what, me? Who, me? Well, yeah, me, you. And he will rule them with a rod of iron in, uh, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. And that, and um, his power of them shall be like that which I myself receive from my father and I'll give him the morning star. Wow. I mean, that is deep. That is some heady, heady stuff that God wants to give us for overcoming. And that's what he's called us into. Go to Mark chapter 4. I think, you know, sometimes just because we are in this battle, and you know, God has called us to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, and it's a full-time job. <laughs> overcoming the world, the flesh, and the devil, yeah. it's just a full-time job. It's reality. It's, it's our reality, okay? It's what he's called us to. We accept it. We want to do it. We want to please him. He's given us everything we need to do it, and it is our life. But it is a full-time job, and I think sometimes we forget who we are. Um, in Mark 4, uh, verse 24, he says to them, Be careful, Jesus says, what you're hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear 
will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. And more besides will be given to him who hears. For to him who who, uh, has will more be given. And from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. Well, if it's measure of thought and study, then it's the word, and it's revelation from the word, or the treasures that God is giving us to get this job done that he wants to get done. And that's not dying and going to heaven. You know, that is being his disciple until the very end until he brings the kingdom into the earth. And there's a lot to that. There's a lot of details in that. And we're going to get into some of that tonight. Uh, Go to Matthew chapter 13. And I think sometimes we just forget that of who, who we are. How blessed we are. How absolutely blessed we are. You know, it says in James, Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, when you're enveloped in and encounter trials of any sort for the, uh, you know, these things produce patience and endurance and all these things. And he says, hey, let it have full play and do a thorough work. Right? And that's where we are a lot of the time. And, you know, a lot of times you feel like you're failing. You don't feel like you're doing a very good job of overcoming. And a lot of times, maybe we're not. (laughs) But thank God his mercies are new every morning or every minute if that's what you need. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just a matter of, hey, Lord, I am not really cutting it here. And um, man, I need your mercy here. And you know what? It's there for you. And that's what he wants you to do. Just come to him and tell him, hey, I'm not really cutting this too good. You know, and he understands. We have not come this way before. Uh, But in uh, Matthew uh, 13, we'll start at verse 11, Jesus said to them, and he's saying to you, right? To you it has been given to know the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, right? But to them it's not been given. For whoever has uh, spiritual knowledge, or revelation knowledge, to him will more be given. He'll be furnished richly so that he will have abundance from him who has not. What he has will be taken away. He says, this is the reason I speak to them in parables because having the power of seeing, they don't see. And having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they grasp and understand. You know, he, should, he said over there in, in Daniel 12, he said the teachers and those who are wise shall understand. But you've got to be wise. and You have to want it. You have to dig for it. Indeed, in, the, in them is the uh, process of fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, you shall indeed hear and hear not, neither grasp and understand, look and look, but never perceive and see. For this nation's heart has grown fat and dull, and their ears heavy and difficult of hearing, and their eyes they have tightly closed, lest they see and perceive with their eyes and hear and comprehend the sense with their ears, and grasp and understand with their heart and turn and I should heal them. See, that's the thing. That's the whole process, really, of transformation is we see it in the Word, we hear it, we grasp it, we understand it, and we go, oh, I need to turn. You know, repentance is to change your thinking. Change your minds, change the way you think to be like the way God thinks. That's what he wants. This is the renewal of your mind. But blessed are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they do hear. And truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous men 
yearned to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And in these last days, we, in this generation, those who are looking are seeing things that even people 10 or 15 years ago didn't see. These things were sealed until the time of the end. And to me, that's one of the, the signs that we're into the time of the end because we're seeing things in Scripture that we've read a thousand times and then, bam, God gives us the revelation and the truth about it and we're beginning to see, oh, and he says, more shall be given. It's going to be more and more and more and more. And we, this is no place to stop now because now we're going to be moving into deeper things and things that only we're going to be, the only way to know it is through the revelation of the Spirit, is by walking with God and communing with Him and having the Holy Spirit unveil things that have been fenced and hidden from the foundation of the world. And God is going to reveal it to us. And that will bring about our victory as we follow him. But um, go, to, um, go to 2 Corinthians 5. You know, this was 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a scripture that we all, you know, know very well. We all cut our teeth on this from the very beginning. Therefore, if any person is in Christ, he is a new creation, right? A, a new creature altogether. The old has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. We just have to remind ourselves, look, we're a new creation. We really are. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. You know, it says we're seated with him in heavenly places. You're like, well, how can that be? Because you're a new creation. You can do that because of who you are. Because of what God made you through what Jesus did for us and our accepting that covenant, we can be at two places in one time because we're spirit beings now. We're seated in heavenly places, and yet here I am in my body right here, right? Verse 19, it was God personally present in Christ reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal, as it were, through us. We beg of you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor and be reconciled to God. For our sake he made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in and through him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? Wow. I mean, if you just, you know, read over that like a newspaper, you're really missing it. God has called us to be his righteousness and his ambassadors in the earth. This is who we are. We're spirit beings. You know, the, all over the world, all throughout history, everybody wants to be free. Everybody wants to be free. Who doesn't want to be free? But there's only one way to be free. It's through Jesus Christ. He's the mediator between God and man. Well, look at Galatians. Uh, I think it's chapter, I mean, yeah, uh, Ephesians, I think, chapter 5, is it? No, it's Galatians 5, then. 
Yes, Galatians 5. Verse 1. In this freedom Christ has made us free. He has completely liberated us. Stand fast then, and do not be hampered and snared and in submit again to the yoke of slavery, right? God doesn't want us to be slaves anymore, you know? Whatever sins we used to be in, we were slaves to those sins. We were in the yoke of bondage to that. And, and the, the Jews were in the yoke of bondage to the law. And Christians are trying to bring the law back in to put the yoke back on. And, and God has done what the law couldn't do. Right? Uh, look at verse 4. If you seek to be justified and declared righteous and to be given right standing with God through the law, you are brought to nothing. You are separated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Wow. Wow. Why would you want to be in that again? No. No. That's not what he wants. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Uh, look at Ephesians uh, 1. Verse 4, even as in his love he chose us, he actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Wow. That we should be holy and blameless in his sight, even above reproach, reproach before him in love. You know, the world, they just look at that. I don't want to be holy. I don't care about being blameless. No, these are high and holy things. This is what God has called us to. This is the world of the future, folks. This is the way it's going to be. You know, I talked about people last week. I get a little, little out there about being, you know, famous rock musicians or whatever country music, and they want people to worship them and see how great they are, you know. And look, if you have a God-given talent like that, God wants you to use it for Him. And let me give you a bit of business advice. Uh, you would do well to use that talent for Him because all that other stuff that you're involved in, it's coming to an end. It's being judged and it's going to be done away with. Music in the world in this world, will be for God. And it'll be more glorious and spectacular than anything you've come up with thus far. And look, it all basically sounds the same. And let me tell you, we have a creator God, and he can show us how to worship him and bring praise to him in a gazillion different ways. And we haven't even begun to explore all the ways that, that we could be uh, worshipers of God with instruments or our voices or whatever. And look, and being an ambassador or an evangelist, you know, they cookie cut everything in the body of Christ. There's a gazillion ways God can use people to be his evangelist or be in his ambassadors. We don't have to be like anybody else. We don't. We just have to be free in Him. And He, he is creative. We don't have to be like anybody else. We don't have to be like each other. We're all very unique. And God loves it that way. He loves it that way. He just wants you to be led by His Spirit. And let me tell you, you be really led by God's Spirit, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, you, God will do spectacular things through you. He's going to do it, let me tell you. I'm just saying, if, if you want to go where it's going to go, get on God's team through Jesus Christ, the mediator of the covenant, 
And we have got amazing things ahead of us. Absolutely amazing. Things that would just blow your mind. I remember Owen used to say, hey, if you could figure out what the millennial kingdom's going to be like, you're thinking too low. Right? He hadn't even begun to show us. Wow. But it's coming. And here we are. I mean, it is almost here. Right? So we got to hold fast what we have until he comes. Look at... Uh, Oh, where should we go from here? Go to John 16. Let's do that. I mean, I'm just jamming here because I could be, really, I could, I, within an hour, I had 50 scriptures written down. I mean, and I could go on and on about all that God has done and what He's called us to. And it's all in the Word. You know, in John 16, 12, he says, I have still many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them or to take them upon you or grasp them now. Right? Well, you know, you know what? That's still true today. He has many things to show us. We're just not ready for it yet. But you know what? We are soon to be ready because he has a time set. These are Moedims. They're set times. And he's going to fulfill them. And they're coming and approaching very quickly. But you know what? The rock of stubborn resistance doesn't look like when you hit it for a long time it's doing much, but eventually you'll see there was a lot of cracks on the inside. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. We... we there are things we haven't perceived yet that are maybe right in front of us, but we just hadn't seen it yet. I mean, I remember the day Ray was in the kitchen. I was standing right over there. It was just a few months ago, and we had the old timeline up where we had the, the seven-year covenant and Daniel's 70th week is the same. And Ray goes, What's the Lord showing you about the timeline? And I'm looking at it. I'm standing right over there. It was kind of dark in here. And the light was on in the kitchen. And I said, I'm looking at it, Ray. And God's saying to me, it's right in front of you. You're just not looking at it right. I mean, in my spirit, he was just showing that to me. You're just not looking at it right. And, you know, and I'm just I'm looking at it. And I said, he said, I'm just not looking at it right. And the next morning I got up and I, I flipped the Bible open. I just flipped it open. And it was Daniel chapter 8 where he was talking about the 2300 evenings and morning. And I read it and I laid it on the timeline. Ah, there it was, right there. I mean, hey, that's just a God thing, you know. I mean, we're talking about it the day before. I flipped the Bible open. I'm not even thinking about it. And there it was. And that's just a small example because now God is moving us into deep things. Deep things, fenced in and hidden. And He's going to show us how to do things in the Spirit we never dreamed we could do. Right? Because Why? Why? Because we're following the Lamb wherever He goes. And you know what? The lamb can go anywhere he wants to go. He owns it all, right? And we're going to follow him wherever he goes. That's what it says. Uh, what was that? Yeah. Uh, For he will not speak his own message, the Holy Spirit, but he will tell whatever he hears. He will announce and declare the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will honor and glorify me because he will take and receive what is mine and reveal it to you. I've said from the very beginning, you don't understand end time prophecy or really anything else without God revealing it to you. That's how he builds his church. That's why the gates of hell do not prevail against it because God gives it to us through direct revelation through his word. Right? And 
that is a beautiful thing. The things of God, He doesn't want us to figure out with our brain. He wants us to reveal it to us by His Holy Spirit. And we have this Holy Spirit living within us, right? I mean, that's awesome. We're new creations, and we have God's Spirit right in us, right? And He reveals His Word to us as we read it, right? Go to 1 Peter 1. I mean, these are familiar scriptures, but these are things we must hold fast. We must. Verse 3, Praise be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. By His boundless mercy, we have been born again into an ever-living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Right? Ever-living hope. Born anew into an inheritance which is beyond the reach of change and decay. Unsullied and unfading, reserved in heaven for you. And you know what? It says the, the Holy Spirit that we got filled with is the guarantee of our receiving the inheritance. It's the guarantee of it. It's just the down payment. And we who are being guarded and garrisoned by God's power through faith till we fully inherit that final salvation that is ready to be re revealed in the last time should be exceedingly glad on this account. Though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. Maybe? Yeah. No, we've been there for a long time. But that's okay. Verse 13, so brace up your minds. Be sober. Be alert. Set your hope wholly and unchangeably on the grace that is coming to you when Jesus is revealed. Look, Jesus doesn't have to show up. <laughs> he doesn't have to show up here, right, with the troops. No, no, He's revealed to you through the Holy Spirit, right? When Jesus is fully revealed in us, right? What is that? Uh, let's look at that. 1 John chapter 3. In verse 2, Beloved, we are even here and now God's children. It yet not yet disclosed what we shall be, but we know that when He comes and is manifested, we shall resemble and be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We see Him because He reveals Himself to us, and He is the Word, right? Jesus is the Word. You do know that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word uh, became flesh and tabernacled among us, right? He is the Word. It's the title by which He is called is the Word of God. The whole Word, all the Word. You know, after His resurrection, when He was talking to Cleopas and Mary, and they were all upset, and He catches up with them, and He's explain, explaining to them in Moses and the Psalms and the Prophets, all that, that had taken place, that were prophesied. He used the whole word, right? Not just the gospel. The gospel is wonderful and great, no doubt about it, but he used the whole word, and so do we, right? Surely the Lord will do nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets, right? Amos 3, verse 7, correct. That's what he's doing, right? Because we're his friends, Right? We give him awe and respect and reverence. But at the same time, we're his friends. It's awesome. 
Verse tw- uh, we'll go back to uh, 1 Peter 1. Verse 20, uh, I'll get it out here in a minute. Verse 20. It is true that he was chosen and foreordained before the foundation of the world, but he was brought out into public view in these last days for the sake of you. Verse 23. You have been regenerated, born again, not from mortal origin, but from one that is immortal by the ever-living and lasting Word of God. See that? We're born of the Word. The Word is the seed, not U.S. dollars to be put in a basket so you can get your hundredfold return and pull on your string and say, hey God, I'll take another BLT and a root beer float, please. It's just silly what people have turned uh, God's provision for us into the prosperity message. And they've turned, you know, yeah, I would above that all that you'd prosper and be in health even as your soul does prosper. And let me tell you, when you have that attitude that you can just jerk God's chain and, well, I, I, I confess by faith that, you know, I'm going to have this new car, new house, you know, you really missed the point. You took a real turn somewhere because the real treasures are treasured up in in heaven right where moth and rust do not consume they're what God is doing for us and that's what I'm trying to tell you tonight to these things we must hold fast you know several months ago when all these signs up here uh, were happening back in the fall or last last uh, August and September and we were putting together with all the, the lunar tetrods coming back from 1949 and 67 and all that, and all the things that we've explained that go with that. And I got up here to minister it a couple of weeks ago. I think we did a video. I couldn't remember it. I mean, the world puts a whammy on you. You know, and, and I was asking Ray, what, what was that? And Ray was like, I don't remember. I had to go back and, you know, Restudy it. And, you know, these are the things we have to hold fast. The world will try to rob it from you. Even the body of Christ, people in there will try to rob. Oh, there's nothing to that. Oh, come on. Nothing happened. They don't even know how to read the signs. They can tell you what the weather's going to do just because, uh, you know, the National Weather Service tells them through a computer, right? But, They don't know how to read God's signs. And Jesus said, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars in the end times. There are signs. They're supposed to be there for us to interpret what they are. And so we have, and we should hold fast. Hold fast. Those things. Uh, Go to Luke 9. You know, and especially in these last days, you know, it says over there in 2 Timothy 3 that they would come in perilous times, hard to deal with and hard to bear, right? Well, you know, they can, uh, it puts a whammy on you. Everything out there in the media is, is trying to mind control everybody. And... We just need to hold fast what God's promises are, what he's given to us. Luke 9, 23, if any person wills to come after me, let him deny himself, let him forget and lose sight of himself and his own interest, right? And take up his cross and follow me. See, this being business of being a disciple and following the Lamb wherever He goes, uh, this is a real commitment. I mean, we're not talking simple salvation here. We're talking follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Whoever would preserve His life, it says, will lose it. 
But he who would, uh, let's see if I read that right. He would preserve his life will save it, and he would lose and destroy it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will preserve and save it. Right? This is the thing about eating from the tr fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that, that all the elites of the world are trying to do. They all want freedom. They all want eternal life. They all want to go to heaven, what they think is, but they don't want to do it through Jesus. And he is the mediator. There's none other name given among men whereby you must be saved. You can't do it through science. And they think they have it, you know. They got the world by the tail and they have all this technology and everything, but you know what? It's going to fail them. It isn't going to work. He put flaming swords there, right, to guard the tree of life. And you ain't going to get past it. It's just the way it is. You have to come through Jesus Christ. That's the way God prescribes it. And that's the way it's going to be. There's not going to be any other way. That is the way it's going to be. It's what I'm telling you. If you got some talent, you start using that talent for the Lord because that's where it's going. He's judging the world. He's going to judge it. He's going to destroy the corruptors of the earth. The corruptors of the earth. Do you see what's happening in the corruption of the earth? His creation? Well, he's going to destroy those people for doing that. And he's bringing in his kingdom. He's going to do it the way he wants to do it. In John 12, he says, uh, well, let's read it because it's just easier. <laughs> It, yeah, 26, John 12, 26. If anyone serve me, he must continue to follow me. Right? It isn't this, well, I'm saved and I got my fire insurance and um, now I'm just, Lord, bless me and bless me what I do over here and bless me what I do over here and, oh, Lord, bless my business and bless this and bless that. And he's going, no, hold on a minute, just... Just stop for a minute. Follow me. I'm, I'm not following you. You follow me. See, we get that all backwards. God called us to follow him. Not, us, not him following us around and blessing us and cleaning up all our messes after us. Right? Oh, boy. Continue to follow me. And wherever I am, there will my servants be also. Jesus came as a servant. Why should we think we have been called to anything less? God's called us to be servants. Right? Absolutely right. Uh, John 15. I'm just saying... These things we must hold fast. We have to hold these fast. I mean, God has shown us things, amazing things. Man, He has got a whole lot more to show us. A whole lot more. And we must continue to follow Him. Right? He says, John 15, I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit he cuts away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch in me that continues to bear fruit, to bear more, richer, uh, and more excellent fruit, right? I remember Joyce Myers used to say, yeah, John 15, well, you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't, <laughs> right? But it's good to know that you're abiding in him, that you're being pruned because he wants to bring more excellent fruit out of you because if you're not abiding in him and you're under the illusion that you know, you, you're in this uh, on the one end of the spectrum you know, prosperity and hyper grace or on the other end of the spectrum you're trying to do it through the law and works well you might not know 
why you're going through what you're going through. And God's called you to that narrow way, to that little sweet spot where you walk in the Spirit with Him, in intimate fellowship with Him. And it's through the Word. It's the Word. The Word is... is the Word is our anchor. The Word is our source. It's our everything. The Word. That's where we have our relationship with Him. And in the Spirit, there is a narrow way there. Yeah, I know that narrow means straightened and compressed by pressure, but let me tell you, you try to walk that narrow way in this world, and it, there's pressure. Because there's everything against you in this realm to stop you from that. You know, Satan is the god of this world. He, he is the seducer and deceiver of all humanity the world over. And he hasn't been cast down yet. Yeah, he was cast down before Adam and Eve because he exalted himself, but he regained control because he deceived and beguiled Eve and Adam. And so he got control of the world again, right? And he is the accuser of the brethren, going before the God, accusing the brethren. What, what is it? Uh, categorizing everybody. That's why it all looks cookie cutter. He just categorizes everybody. Well, these are a, and these are a this, and these are a this, and that's how each of them act. And God's going, man, that ain't me. I can do way more than that. Yeah, he can work within all of that. No problem for him. But he doesn't have to, and he'd rather not. He'd rather you be free. He'd rather you would just walk in the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit uniquely do things for each situation. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the Word which I have given you. Praise God. Dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Right? Live in me and I'll live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself, Without abiding in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. See, that's the prescription. Just abide in him. That's what he wants. You, you know, there may be people out there, well, you know, I have this weakness and I have this in the flesh and, you know, I just can't seem to do it. Well, I understand. You know, Jesus said the flesh is weak. And some of you younger people, it's a difficult world to be in. And we understand, we've all been there, and we get that. You can, he, look, you're naked before him, no pun intended, uh, and he knows all of it already. And instead of just hiding from him, just go before him and, and tell him your problem. Talk to him about it. You know, if your heart is, I know this displeases you, and I, I can't walk with you, with this in my life, he will help you with it. Just be honest with him. He already knows it, right? Because he wants a relationship with you, right? Very intimate, very personal. And if, you, if you're just having these problems, who hasn't had problems of some sort or another, right? And God will show you how to get that out of your life. He will show you how to do it. He will give you that wisdom. He's looking for a repentant heart, a heart that reverences him. And that's, what it, that's all it takes. He just wants you to come to him in that way. Uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever lives in me bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If a person does not dwell in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers, right? Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire. They are to be burned. If you live in me and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. That's why I'm saying this whole name it and claim it, grab, blab it and grab it, type of 
teaching in the Word is, is absolute nonsense. That's not what God's looking for in the body of Christ. He's looking for spiritual maturity. And why would you want anything less than that? The, the only reason a whole lot of you go for that other stuff is because you hear somebody very slickly present that to you and you haven't heard what God really wants, which is so far above that, it's not even in comparison. If God wants you to be like Him, how does that compare with you prospering in this world? It doesn't. It doesn't even compare. And if you're like Him, if you get to that, that stature, you'll be like that for eternity. This is all very temporal here. You know, even, even after the thousand years, He's going to make a new sky and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And this isn't a bunch of religious gobbledygook. This is reality. This is the things, this is our destiny, and this is what we must hold fast. This is our future. This is what we invest in. We invest our lives in the Word to receive these things. Because it's God's will. It's His will. And it's His highest and best. The world can do all that other stuff without God. In fact, the mega church does it all the time. And they think God's blessing them. And you know what? He's not. He's blessing them with mercy, but basically they're just working a marketing scheme, and it works. You know, Peter Drucker knew how to do his stuff on marketing, and that's where all that comes from. But Peter Drucker, he was the mentor to Rick Warren, and he was a, a marketing genius. He was actually an atheist and a communist. And uh, he worked, I think, all the way up till he was 96 years old. Lived here in America, and he was the mentor to Rick Warren. Don't you see it more like a infiltration? Oh, absolutely. It, it's a definitely an infiltration. You know? <laughs> the, look, the powers that may be do not mind the Billy Grahams of the world, they don't mind the Rick Warrens of the world or, you know, the prosperity teachers of the world. They don't mind that. In fact, they probably fund it. They don't mind that at all. It keeps people blind. And they can continue to do what they're doing. See, they're deep in the occult. Right? They're deep in the occult. And they want to continue to move up that ladder because they think they're going to receive, you know, and um, they're deceived about it, but they don't mind that other stuff. But if you get real with God, if you get deep into his revelation, they don't like that. That threatens them, right? And they don't like to fund that. Look at verse 16. You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have appointed you, I have planted you, that you might go and bear fruit, and keep on bearing, that your fruit may be lasting, that it may remain and abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, it will be given you. If you bear fruit in the Spirit, and that can be the fruit of the Spirit, or that can be the fruit of righteousness, just the fruit of your ways as walking in the Spirit, if you're doing that, if you're bearing that kind of fruit, you're not asking God for things. <laughs> he already knows you need them. He'll provide them. You, you are asking God for deeper things. And that's what God has called us to, deeper things. And when they do bear fruit and they get so ripe and their clusters so big, like 144,000, he harvests them. This is in-gathering, in-gathering, right? 
is a barley crop. It's ingathering. That's an ingathering right there. They bear fruit by then too, right? First fruits rapture, last trumpet rapture, harvest rapture in the fall. First Thessalonians 5. A couple more scriptures and we'll wrap it up. Verse 23, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. It separates you from profane things and make you pure and wholly consecrated to God. This is what we're about. I think it's 2 Thess- Corinthians 7, 1. He says, Let us cleanse ourselves of everything that contaminates body and spirit. Right? God has called us to that. You want God's highest and best? This is where you go. That's the direction you take. You know, okay, the flesh doesn't like it. The world doesn't like it. Well, we're not for that. We've seen something higher. God has shown us higher things, deeper things. Right? And this is the way that we have to go. And you may think it's uncool, but who cares what you think or the world thinks? God thinks it's cool. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved, sound and complete and blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. Right? Spirit, soul, and body. Faithful is he who is calling you and utterly trustworthy. And he will also do it. He'll do it. You give him the faith, you give him the walk of your life with him, he'll do it. Because he doesn't lie and he doesn't fail. When he makes his promises, he keeps his promises. It's not like the world. Right? Right? To these things we must hold fast because great persecution is coming to the world. It is coming. There will be pressures for you to quit. Let me tell you, there will be. There's no doubt about it because there's too much at stake. Satan ain't going to give up his kingdom easily. Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 21, Hebrews 7, 21. For those who formerly came priests received their office, office without its being confirmed by the taking of an oath by God. But this one was designated and addressed and saluted with an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not regret it or change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, which you talked about many times. In keeping with this oath, Jesus became the guarantee of a better agreement, a more excellent covenant, right? The one which we speak of. The former line of priests was made up of many because they were prevented by death from continuing perpetually in office. But he holds his priest priesthood unchangeably because he lives on forever. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost, completely, perfectly, finally, and for all time and eternity, those who come to God through him, since he is always living to make petition to God 
and intercede with him and intervene for them. You see what a great promise that is? Able to save to the uttermost. And that priesthood he's called us into as companions and participators with him. That's pretty amazing. That is high and holy calling, right? That is amazing. So, these things we must hold fast. You're new creations. You're filled with God's Spirit. God has given you His Word. He's revealed His mysteries and secrets to you. The age is heading up. It's coming to an end. And His new age is coming. Not the new age that the occults have because that's all a counterfeit of what he's doing. But he's got a new age coming where he's going to do away with lawlessness. <coughs> and we have to continue to prepare and continue to receive what he has for us. And it just behooves us to hang on to those things that he has showed us that much more so that we are not deceived. Because Jesus said about the end time, he said, be careful that no one deceives you. Let's look at one more scripture. First John, I think it is. I thought it was. Yeah, 4, 1. Beloved, do not put faith in every spirit, but prove, test the spirits to discover where they proceed from God. For many false prophets have gone forth into the world. That's just the way it is. Jesus said it was going to be that way at this time. You see it everywhere when you get into it. And... We have to be very careful to test and prove all things with the Word until we can recognize what's good, and to that we hold fast. So we do thank you, Father, that you have called us to these high things, these deep things, and that you want us to have them, and that you've called us. It's your idea. It's your plan. It's your way. It isn't ours, it's yours. And we want to be a part of it. You've called us to be a part of it. And we just submit ourselves to you and we ask that you continue to reveal yourself to us that we can be like you in Jesus' name.